Alyssa Rubin Pellet to talk about uh, American education in the Gulf. My name is Phil Frain. I'm a visiting fellow this year at the Middle East Institute. I'm normally a State Department bureaucrat trying to defend U.S. policy around the world. Um, so this is much more enjoyable to be here at the Middle East Institute this year. Um, Middle East Institute is the oldest research institution uh, in America specializing in the Middle East. Our mission here is to inform Americans about what's going on in the Middle East. We don't normally take positions. We don't advocate particular positions. Our, our business is uh, more educational in the sense we try to arrange lectures and write articles and do research on various topics in the Middle East. So this has been a particularly interesting year for me to be a fellow over here uh, since, uh, since there's a lot going on in the Middle East, as you may have noticed. Uh, one of the things that's been going on for the past several years is the expansion of American education in the Middle East. Uh, of course, I'm sure you all know that uh, the idea of American universities in the Middle East is not new. The two most well-known institutions are the American University of Beirut and the American University of Cairo. Some of you may have studied at one of those two institutions. And Elisa will talk about uh, the foundings of some of those, uh, of American University in Beirut in particular, um, and then talk about the new universities that have opened up, particularly in Qatar uh, and the UAE. You've got NYU, Carnegie Mellon, uh, Cornell, and, and a bunch of others that have opened up. And what are the prospects for their success or not? Who is attending these universities? Is it just the elites, or do others also attend them? And how might American-style education uh, change these societies for better or worse? Um, since we only have an hour, and Elisa, this is, by the way, um, part of a book that Elisa has written that will be coming out later on this year about uh, American education in the Middle East. Uh, working title? We don't have a working title yet. Reflections on American education in the Middle East. Um, and so we look forward to that book coming out later on in the fall. Uh, so I won't delay you anywhere. A special welcome also to Elisa's students. There we have, what, 20 Argov fellows with us today? Shalom. Special welcome to you. So, Elisa. Thank you, Phil. It's, uh, it was a little difficult for me to distill what I've been working on for five years and what is a 400-page manuscript that's about to be published by Harvard University Press into a half an hour talk. But what I tried to do was get to a lot of the main points, the big picture, and I'll raise a lot of uh, points that you can pursue in discussion if you have greater interest in them. I first came to this topic because as someone who studies the modern Middle East, as it's well known to everyone, there's a big problem with the young generation, the lack of jobs, the fact that higher education doesn't seem to be training people for, for the modern workplace, for the global workplace, for the private sector. So I wondered whether um, American higher education might be the answer. And what I found is it might be the answer in some cases. It definitely won't solve the entire uh, problem, but I think it can make an important difference. A lot of what's written about this topic tends to be journalistic. This is a topic that's changing very rapidly. Things are happening on the ground. It's hard to really make assessments about long-term prospects as it's just been starting. But I'm a historian by training, and I thought it would be useful to actually look back into the past. And actually, to start off with the question, why would an American university be exported to another country? So I looked at the... Um, the whole issue, which turns out to be quite controversial, and there's two main schools of thought dealing with this issue. One of them is more negative, and that's a view that American universities overseas is a form of cultural imperialism. It's taking the Western model and, and putting it on, and especially you can see that from the colonial period, when well, that actually did happen as part of colonialism. So that's a more negative view, which you still see today. On the other hand, there's an extremely positive view about this phenomenon, and that's as part of globalization. There is a trend or a school of thought, people saying, well, higher education is just another commodity that's becoming globalized, and what we really are looking towards is free trade in minds. So in other words, any university could be transferred anywhere, and it will just work. So my research, when I really began to um, delve into the topic, my conclusion comes out somewhere in the middle. And I first looked back, and the historical perspective reveals a much more complex reality. First of all, 
what I found is that every university has always been a cross-cultural uh, institution. All of them exhibit foreign influences. So every university system around the world combines national and international influences to varying degrees, as well as having been shaped by its own particular historical realities. And I should also mention here that all modern universities actually are Western institutions and tracing their roots back to the medieval universities of Bologna and Paris. So what is an American university? That was the first question to start with. And an American university, it turns out, is not any pure product itself, but it has uh, several main influences. The first influence on American universities uh, was the British universities. The first attempts to uh, form American universities were inspired by Cambridge and Oxford, recreating them in New England. So those universities took on, from Cambridge and Oxford, the idea of a residential learning community, the idea of teaching liberal arts and training, at the time, men to be leaders in the community. Uh, second influence developed a bit later, in the 19th century, and that was the influence of the German Research University. And that's during the period in the mid-1800s in the U.S. when uh, universities started to develop graduate programs, Ph.D. programs, and research. So that was the second main influence. One um, university started at the time, with uh, Johns Hopkins, other universities were starting based on this German Research University model. The third main influence is actually an American influence, and the Morrill Act of 1862 created land-grant universities. So land-grant universities are public state universities. Uh, mainly you see them in, in the Midwest, a lot in the West. And they're very much linked to local development, local issues, taking the local people and helping build local businesses in the area. In addition, um, universities are shaped by specific historical circumstances. Any university, I, I would argue, a university still remains, even in a global era, a national institution. They're shaped by um, events such as wars. The Cold War had an impact on American universities, the kind of research that was being funded, for example. So that has an influence as well. You also see many adaptations and innovations on the way. So if I say a university was inspired by Cambridge and Oxford, it didn't end up looking like Cambridge and Oxford. There were a lot of, uh, a lot of changes on the way. So the bottom line is that this U.S. higher education that's being exported is not a pure national product in any way. Then I decided to look at the other side of the coin, at the Arab universities and their history. The modern Arab university actually has no links to the medieval madrasa system, which actually tended to, uh, to, 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 to wane in its influence. And some people have argued that the reason it lost its influence is because it was very insular and very inward-looking, and there was little cross-cultural fertilization. So the modern universities in the Arab world were not created at all based on that model, well, with some exceptions, like you do have some universities like Al-Azhar, which are purely Islamic universities. But the modern universities in the Arab world are shaped by British, French, and American models, as well as their colonial legacy. You also see missionary schools, such as the American University of Beirut, and um, they came early in the, in the 19th century. And when the Arab state universities developed after the independence of the states, they were based very heavily on foreign models. So the bottom line for the Arab world is that it actually lacks its own modern academic tradition and has relied very heavily on foreign models. So you have a mixed model coming to a mixed model. And next I wanted to examine the, the whole process or uh, the whole process of educational export. So it's not surprising, given what I've described, this high degree of cross-cultural fertilization, there is strong precedent for the idea of exporting universities. It was very widespread, especially during the colonial period, where universities were often founded in the colonies with a very specific purpose in mind, and that was to train educated elites that could serve in the colonial administration. However, these tended to train elites that were very alienated from their own societies. Today, it's a very different situation, at least in the area that, that I examine in my book. Today, it's the host governments, especially in the Persian Gulf, they're the ones calling the shots, and they're the ones also paying for this whole project, so they're footing the bill as well. But one thing we can say about all periods, a common denominator, is that this process of export tends to be very complex and, most importantly, unpredictable. The result that you get always differs from the intention and always the new institution is shaped by its new environment. And the argument I develop in my book is that an important factor for success is something that I call localization. 
that if a university wants to succeed in the new environment, an American or any other foreign university, it has to localize or adapt flexibly to the new environment and plant deep roots in the local society. So I'm arguing that a university is much more than a business, that it actually uh, does have to be localized. But I'm also arguing that what we're seeing right now is not cultural imperialism because it's being invited by the governments in the Arab world. So I want to take a brief look at localization and how it's changed over time. Uh, I'm going to start off, a, a whole chapter of my book is about the American University of Beirut, which is a fascinating institution. I ended up spending almost a year researching it. It was founded in 1866 by Daniel Bliss, an American missionary, who single-handedly built a university from the ground up. And this university has played a very important role, not just in Lebanon, but also in the region, in educating elites and creating a high-quality research university. And the more I read, the more I became fascinated with the question, how did this university manage to survive, actually? Because it's been through so many periods of war. It's been under so many different governments, and yet it's always remained open. And I think the most extreme situation was during the 1975 Civil War, when the university almost did not survive, actually. There were 16 assassinations, including the president of American University of Beirut, Malcolm Kerr, in 1984, 59 kidnappings, shellings, beatings, bombings. There were also two campuses of the university at that time in East and West Beirut. Yet somehow the university survived. And I trace that to the fact that it became deeply localized. I discuss this more extensively in the book, but I'll just talk about the two most striking lessons that I found about that we can learn from the experience of the AUB. First of all, it's very important if you're a foreign university overseas to play local politics. The AUB, starting from Daniel Bliss on, always maintained good relations with the authorities, whoever those authorities might have been, and was even willing to compromise on ideals such as academic freedom and, and other things that were important in order to remain open. And the place that this was most telling was actually um, its medical school. This was the most fascinating thing I learned about the AUB, that during every war, the AUB doctor and nurses were out there on the front lines, and they gave medical services to combatants on all sides in every single conflict. And a lot of them paid for that with their lives. So I think that one thing that, that often does not come up with a lot of the US universities that are now going overseas is that it's really um, going into the Middle East is not for the faint-hearted. <laughs> It really, you have to understand where you're going and that there could be a price to pay if you really want to develop roots in the local society. The other interesting lesson from AUB is about adaptation. Whenever you take a university and move it to another country, you're inevitably, inevitably going to uh, see some clashes of culture. And this is, was the most fascinating thing about AUB, is that actually in the classroom from the beginning, it was teaching American ideals, freedom of speech, critical thinking. And the students were very enthusiastic about that. And in the 1970s, this actually almost brought down the university. Because the students, um, the campus became well known as a hotbed of political dissent. Just like in the States at the time, the students were very activist and they, they had student strikes. It led to violent uh, intervention by security forces. They took over administration buildings. At one point, even in the 70s, um, a disgruntled student came on campus and murdered one of the deans. And so this almost brought down the university, actually, because here were the students saying, we learned this freedom of speech in the classroom. We want to act on it. And the university, at the same time, the administration is trying to stay out of politics because it wants to stay open. It wants to maintain good relations with the authorities. It doesn't want to get involved. And the very ironic fact from this case study is why did the university survive? It was actually because of the Civil War that broke out, because then everyone forgot about the activism and had to worry about the bigger crisis. So those are the two lessons from localization in the 19th century and 20th century. As I mentioned today, the situation is very, very different. Today, you see um, localization coming from above. The AUB, or the American University of Cairo, it's one institution starting from bottom up, from the ground up. But today, you see American universities as part of national strategies of governments. And what I look at specifically in my book is three countries. I look at Qatar, I look at UAE, and I look at Kuwait. I'll only mention Kuwait briefly here in this talk because the Kuwaiti model has been to send most of its students interested in American higher education to the United States. The argument being, well, if you want American education, get it at the source. Why would you want to bring it over to the Arab world? But I want to look at two other countries that have taken a different view. 
And these two countries, they actually have taken a very active role in directing and fund funding this whole process with very broad goals. And why are they doing it? These two countries, both blessed with oil, blessed with uh, small populations, so they have a lot of opportunities, have been thinking about the future, the future after oil, and what happens to their country. The way it stands right now is the populations in these countries are about 80% or more foreign, uh, foreign citizens. They pretty much run the country, and not, not the public sector, but the private sector, it's almost completely expatriate workers. So the, gov the Gulf governments want to train their own citizens to shape their nation's uh, destinies. And in Qatar's case, they actually want to become a knowledge-producing society. It's a very ambitious vision. And they see Western higher education as the vehicle to get to this destination very quickly. So again, this is a top-down process. And it's not happening only in the Middle East. It's happening in many other parts of the world as well, such as uh, East Asia. Um, you see this in China, in Malaysia, in Singapore, all of them opening up uh, American universities. I'm mainly going to be speaking about this from the perspective of the governments, but there's a whole other topic that I discuss in my book, and that's why would an American university want to go overseas? And I think today we can see what are they, they're looking for two things. They're looking for revenues in an age of shrinking endowments and the financial crisis, and they're also looking for prestige to increase their international reputation. But I think, as some of them have seen very quickly, there's important risks here as well. Several of these uh, universities have failed and closed down, so they, risk, they, they have risked their reputation and also their finances. So Qatar and the UAE both became independent in 1971, small populations. Um, the UAE is a, a slightly bigger country, 4.6 million as compared to 1.7 million in Qatar. But they both have a similar demographic in that most of the citizens work for the public sector. And these are uh, welfare states where everything is provided by the government, including education, higher education, it's all free. So in Qatar, the US higher education is part of a broad reform strategy. I was very surprised to learn in my research, and I visited Qatar several times, how they have an entire vision of what they want to achieve, and education is very important to them. They took, um, they opened a branch of the Rand Corporation in Doha, and they asked them to reform their entire education system, saying, you can't just reform higher education, you have to start at the preschool level. So they've actually done that, and it's quite a bold, uh, <laughs> a bold experiment because they've reformed every part of their education system. They've opened up charter schools. The goal is to score well on the international tests. And this is a very brave leadership because they went in there and said, we need a benchmark. We need to know where we stand. So they started in the past few years taking the international exams, like PISA and uh, PEARLS, and scoring terribly. <laughs> coming out second to last in the world. But they're saying, we want a benchmark. This is our goal. We have to know where we're starting from. So in 2001, they announced the Education for a New Era Reform, that comprehensive reform scheme, as I mentioned, from uh, preschool to the university. And not only did they bring American higher education, but they've actually done something fairly unprecedented. They took their state university, Qatar University, founded in 1977, and have completely revamped an existing institution, which is a very difficult thing to do. And their goal there is to, to change it, to get American accreditation for that state university, to switch over most of the instruction to English, and they've really reformed that, uh, that university. But I, I want to talk a bit more about what they're doing with the private American universities they've brought over. Probably everyone's heard of Education City which is a campus near Doha, which has right now uh, six U.S. branch campuses. And it also has a faculty of Islamic studies. The faculty of Islamic studies is from Qatar. It's not a foreign branch campus. And what they've done is they've invited uh, programs to come and give one or two degrees in areas that they consider strategic. For example, Cornell Medical School is there. Uh, you have Northwestern School of Journalism. What I found interesting is their goal. The goal in the country, they want to build a knowledge society. They want to use the best of Western technology and know-how, but at the same time, in another important goal is preserving their Muslim and Arab heritage. And just to give you an example of how they're doing that, is alongside these Western uh, campuses, they have, as I mentioned, the Faculty of Islamic Studies, where they have the Karadawi Center for Moderate Thought. 
Okay, you may have all be familiar with uh, Dr. Yusuf al Karadawi. He's an Egyptian theologian tied to the Muslim Brotherhood, has made very many controversial statements um, in the West, but that, that's part of this vision, that the two can coexist together. And they're, they're, th this coexistence takes place in the book, I cover it more extensively, in a lot of interesting ways. When I first started researching this subject, I heard a lot of uh, undercurrent people saying, well, the reason they're opening these branches is because they want to do stem cell research. They can't do it in the US, but you can do it in, the, in these other areas of the world. And actually, um, Karadawi was involved. They have had several um, seminars, conferences, saying in Islam, stem cell research is, is accepted. So they're, they're bringing that in. So the Islam and the Western cutting edge technology can coexist. In addition to just having education, the boldest part of Qatar's vision is actually um, research. The country wants to become a knowledge-producing society. They invest 2.8% of their GDP in R&D, which is among the highest in the world. They actually want to become a world leader uh, in biotechnology, healthcare, become a healthcare hub for the entire region. They're building a several billion dollar hospital called the Sidra Medical Center, and it, it's so ambitious because really I've spoken to a lot of people there. It's starting from a base of nothing, a country that didn't even have a school system 50 years ago. But this is what they're, they're determined to do. A lot of dilemmas come up in this, and this is part of the, the fascinating part of my research. When you take a, 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 an institution from one country and move it to another, there's a clash, inevitable, there is a clash of values. And an issue I looked at in every country was academic freedom. A lot of the countries they're going to are countries that don't have academic freedom, and yet that is one of the cornerstones of American higher education. In Education City, you see some interesting phenomena. Again, showing this kind of slitting behavior, pro-Western but also pro-Islamist. We all know that uh, Doha is the center of Al Jazeera, which is a very, the, the, the most prominent uh, Arabic uh, news network. They also have at Education City, as I mentioned, Northwestern Journalism School, a cutting edge uh, American journalism uh, program. They also opened up there the Doha Center for Media Freedom. And this was very ambitious because they decided that the mission for this center would be to protect, protect journalists from all over the world that, and offer them refuge. And so they brought a French uh, director named Robert Menard and he immediately set off on a very activist agenda. But he made one mistake. In these countries where they're developing freedom of speech, there's one thing you can't criticize, and that's the government of the country. And he said, well, in order to do our work, we also need much more freedom in this country. And they quickly um, kicked him out and shut down the center. They, actually, they recently reopened the center with a more moderate director, and it remains to be seen what's going to come from that. But it's just one example of how they're, they're actually trying to make headroads in these areas, but it's very slow going. The other big issue that comes up is it's the sustainability of this project. It's extremely expensive. They're putting billions of dollars into this. I want to give you one example which shocked me. Cornell Medical School was the first, and I think still the only, US medical school overseas built a beautiful state-of-the-art facility in Doha. It cost $750 million. And the first graduating class in the medical school in 2008 had only 15 students, only whom eight were local citizens. So this is an incredibly expensive experiment. Uh, someone was saying, wouldn't it have been much cheaper just to send them to the US to study? But this was the idea, is to build up this whole medical um, medical industry there, but really they're, they're starting from scratch. The other problem we see everywhere in the region is the lack of qualified students. When American universities come, and we're talking elite universities, they don't want to lower their standards. They don't want to dilute their brand name, but they don't have enough qualified students in the region. Excuse me. So what they're mostly doing, they're starting all kind of found, what they call foundation programs where students have one or two years to get up to speed in English and other skills. But still, they're all competing over the same student pool, and there really aren't enough students to go around. Just to compare that to the UAE, whereas in Qatar, it's the, the education city, the US campuses are part of, part of a whole vision. In the UAE, they have much more of a business model view of, of US higher education. It's also very different because the, uh, the UAE is a, is a system, is a country that has seven different emirates. So it's a, it's a federal system, but education is autonomous. So there's a different policy adopted by each emirate. So I just want to briefly compare Dubai and Abu Dhabi, which are the two dominant uh, emirates where most of the people live. Abu Dhabi is much wealthier. It has most of the oil. It's also more conservative. 
Dubai um, is very flashy, <laughs> has gone into uh, tourism, real estate, tax-free zones. It's, uh, it's quite, and it, 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 it's had other people finance a lot of it. It took a big hit during the financial crisis, but yet higher education has been a also a part of their, their vision. So uh, Sheikh Mohammed is the, uh, the leader of Dubai. He's often called the CEO of Dubai. And just to share one story about higher education, I think it's very telling. He went one time to visit his daughters at Zaid University, which is a state university, to hear them read some poetry. He ended up seeing, and they have a, a beautiful courtyard there, there was a, a student flea market, and students were selling crafts that they had made or someone else had made. And he was very impressed by this, and he actually came back to his office, and the next day he sent over um, two of his workers with two suitcases with $1.7 million to Zaid University. And he asked that the money be distributed to the students who had had this great entrepreneurial initiative to, uh, to open this flea market. So each student got over $5,000. The US, mostly US administrators of the university said, please, can we use that money for books to develop a library? He said, no, I want to develop entrepreneurship, and this is how I'm going to do it. So that's just an example of how everything here is really about business. Even education is about business. So what they have in Dubai and some other of the Emirates is something called an educational free zone. And in an educational free zone, universities can open. They can have 100% foreign ownership. They have tax-free status. And they can have full repatriation of their profits. So like you're in Dubai, but you're completely free. You don't have to follow a lot of the regulations of the country. So the government of Dubai provides the infrastructure and loans. But it doesn't pay for the, for the whole enterprise. The idea is that the revenues from the university will co must cover the costs. And if not, it will shut down. So it's very different from Qatar, where they actually pay for everything, if I didn't say that before. From the buildings to the professor's salary, everything is paid for. Here, it's a different model. The main um, campus is called Dubai International Academic City. And it was opened in 2007. And it's an educational free zone, often referred to, even by the locals, as a mall. <laughs> an educational mall. And it's quite, it's quite surprising when you go there. They have universities from all over the world, varying quality. There's an Iranian university, many Indian universities. And they, the anchor store in this mall was Michigan State University. They wanted one like very reputable research university. So they got them in there, but it quickly closed down because they didn't get enough students and they couldn't maintain the quality. So they didn't want to risk their own reputation. It closed down after two years. It was a very similar story in another emirate called Ras al Khaima, where George Mason University was one of the pioneers in this, uh, in this field. It closed down after two years because they also didn't meet the projections. They couldn't find the qualified students, and they didn't want to lower their, uh, their quality standards. So today, um, in Dubai, it's a bit problematic because of the financial crisis. Because as I mentioned, they were providing the financing but now they don't really have the money. So some of this has been stalled, at least in Dubai. I want to very briefly compare this to Abu Dhabi. Abu Dhabi, as I mentioned, is much wealthier, and they have a completely different strategy. In Abu Dhabi, they want to pay, they're willing to pay, but they want only the best brand names in higher education. Not just higher education, also culture. They've opened up a branch of the Guggenheim Museum in Abu Dhabi. And in terms of universities, they've opened up the Paris Sorbonne and uh, NYU Abu Dhabi. I want to say a few words about NYU Abu Dhabi. I think it's a very interesting example. Uh, I've spoken to many of the administrators actually before it opened, and they call themselves a global network university. They're trying to open up campuses all over the world, and they're very excited about this opportunity because it's all being paid for. And they told me it's a, it offers them a wonderful opportunity to experiment with new kinds of courses and new curriculum, and then they can bring it back to the home campus. This university, in its first year, became I think what might be the most selective university in the world. <laughs> the first year that it opened, it had a 2.1% acceptance rate, which, uh, what did I say here? 9,000 students applied and 180 were accepted. And that compares to a close to 30% acceptance rate on the home campus in New York. And what they did was really, it, it came, it was criticized very heavily. What they did was anyone who made the finals for uh, NYU Abu Dhabi was flown to the campus, wined and dined to get them to actually accept the offer from the school. So, um, a and as it turned out, only 8% of the students enrolled are actually from the UAE. So I would argue that this model, I, I'm not, it's not clear to me what Abu Dhabi um, is expecting to gain from this. Because they get the brand name, it's true but they haven't really thought about making this work for them. 
because not a lot of the students are going to be from the region. They didn't even seem to be, I, I was asking them, are you going to offer Middle Eastern studies or things relevant to the region? And it wasn't really um, an issue to them. So that, that seems to be um, Abu Dhabi's model. A very new and interesting model is also coming out of Abu Dhabi. And that you can see at the Mazdar Institute. Abu Dhabi has a lot of um, ambitions to move into uh, the alternative energy space and that they're really developing there. So they're opening the Science Institute and a new kind of arrangement has developed, a partnership with MIT. MIT said, we don't believe that we should open a branch campus. We want to be your partners because we believe the best way to build a campus is that it be homegrown. We'll advise you, we'll be consultants, but then we want to step back. So I think that might be a new model that's developing in the region because of the risks I mentioned before. Also, like in Qatar, in the UAE, you also see dilemmas. Uh, actually, in Dubai, there's much less academic freedom than in the other places. One statement that I couldn't forget, when I interviewed one professor, told me, we have a, a statement, I smell jet fuel. And what does that mean? It's when a, a professor would make a statement, a controversial statement in the classroom. For example, in uh, Zayed University, a professor talked about the, uh, the, Muhammad, the, the cartoons of Muhammad in the classroom. Within 24 hours, was deported from the country. So academic freedom is not really uh, well developed here. And the professors, who are pretty much this uh, wandering group of Western academics going wherever the job uh, may be, not knowing much about the regions, they, they are very careful about what they say in the classroom. Also here, there's the question of sustainability, because many of the Western universities have not actually uh, met their projections. They couldn't find enough students, and some of them, as I mentioned, have closed down. So I brought up a lot of issues. I just want to uh, talk about a few of my conclusions and then I open it up for discussion. I think from the side of a US university, going into a country is very risky. And I think the trend actually is, after this early euphoria about it, I think a lot of them are trying to do it in more cautious ways. I think we'll see in the future more partnerships, less per se branch campuses, because it's a, it's a pretty big stretch and it can fail as we've seen. From the perspective of the host countries, uh, the results can also be very unpredictable, especially with regard to the inevitable clashes of cultures and values. So there's a lot of areas where we don't know where this is going to lead us. I'm very interested in this whole idea of the academic freedom and the conflicts that have come up. Because if you look back at the example of AUB, you don't know where it's going to lead when you're, you're educating students to a certain um, value system, and, and you don't know where they're going to take that. Uh, second, we don't know about the financial sustainability. Another interesting feature of this I haven't mentioned that I was very surprised to find is that 70% of the students in these new universities are women. It's the highest ratios in the world. So I believe that actually from this, these countries are changing their societies in ways that they don't even know. I spoke to a lot of the female students when I was there. And in Dubai, for example, a very traditional society, and the students, um, most of them were going to have arranged marriages. And in these countries, because they're 70% women, most of the men don't go to college. The good students go overseas, and the others tend to work in the, in the military or the police. And they get a good paying job, but they're not educated. So I was speaking to these young women, and one told me she wanted to do a PhD at Harvard, another open her own business, work in the government. And I said, would you agree to marry someone who does not have a college degree? And several of them told me they would not. And I think that's very interesting in terms of what, they, what could be happening within the society in a very short period of time. Because they're also opening up many new fields of study for women, and they're really taking advantage of that. So that, that could change things pretty quickly. But again, um, what, what do I think is required to succeed in these kind of ventures? In my book, we, when I compare the three countries, I think that Qatar is most likely to succeed because what they have that the others lack is a vision. They have a plan. They have a purpose. They know why they're bringing in this American higher education. They're also giving it the highest level political and financial commitment. And they believe it's very important to find the local relevance. And most importantly, they have a long-term view. I don't think you can create a great university or change your society overnight. It, it could take a generation or two, so you have to be in this for the long haul. So again, this experiment is only in the early stages, but I believe that even in the age of globalization, um, universities tend to reflect and must be relevant to the cultures in which they operate. So I think that's what we have to look at. How much are they trying to adapt them? And just to conclude on a note about what does this all mean in the post-Arab Spring world? 
The countries that I've examined, as I mentioned, are in a very fortunate position. Small populations, uh, very, high, very high GDP. And they can make changes. They have already created, they're ahead of the game in the sense of the higher education reform. And I think they've created what could become a center for the entire region for training the elites. Because I, I didn't mention this, because the minority of the students are from the UAE or Qatar, and a lot are coming from the region. So they're coming and they're offering very generous financial aid. The other countries, I, for example, I visited Egypt for this research, face much bigger problems, large populations, really bad universities and mo huge unemployment problems. But even there, I think U.S. higher education can play a role. I think partnerships could be founded uh, between some of these large land-grant universities that have experience in, in doing this and finding people jobs, being locally relevant, and, and really helping to, to make a difference. Because I think there's a lot of demand for it. It wouldn't be something that would be uh, imposed on the region because I, I really think they're, they're looking for these kinds of solutions. And this could, this could be some of the first steps to solving the uh, employment problem in the region. So I brought up a lot of points, and it's only the tip of the iceberg for what I'm writing about in the book, but I'll, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Lillian. Very informative uh, talk. Obviously, you couldn't do justice to a 450-page no. book in, in 30 minutes, but I think you touched on some very good points. I wanted to just, uh, before we open it up, know if you could expand a little bit on the influence that all these women in these universities might have on their societies, whether in the UAE or in Qatar, other than the fact that they won't marry yeah. men without <laughs> degrees now. Is that going to have some other cultural influences yes. in the society? Maybe you could just yeah. talk a little bit about well, that. Thank you for asking that, because um, one of the most interesting um, people that I researched in the course of my book is Sheikha Moza in Qatar. You might have seen her. She's kind of an iconic leader in the, in the Arab world. And she is the head of the Qatar Foundation. She's the one, head of the foundation that, uh, that, that, is, that is Education City. So since 1995, she's been the head of this project. And she is deeply committed to, uh, to women becoming much more involved in the society, remaining traditional, but becoming much more involved in the society. And she's done a number of interesting things. One thing which I was very impressed by, she brought back a lot of Arab academics that were in the United States. She personally recruited them to come back to Qatar and teach. And I thought that was really amazing. There are several elite programs at Qatar University. One is the English language and literature. One is international affairs. She personally recruited the professors that were in the US, and one was in Georgetown, and one, I believe, was in Wisconsin, to come back and head these programs and serve as role models for these women. So uh, also, as I mentioned, a lot of new fields are opening up for the women. They can study things that they couldn't study before, and uh, especially in Education City. So I think it's very clear. She's the role model. She's trying to show that you can do this. You can have an education. You can work. You can also remain traditional. So I think things will change pretty quickly as a result of that. And they can drive, yeah. <laughs> they always could drive in those countries. Okay, let's open Thank you for uh, the fascinating talk. I actually spent a year at the American University in Cairo, so a lot of what you talked about was familiar. But one thing that really struck me at AUC was how the students at AUC were radically different than the vast majority of Egyptians. What sort of effects in terms of promoting class differences do you think American universities have had on the region? Right. That's an excellent question. And from my research, I concluded that at the American University of Beirut and Cairo, the dream of most of the students, unfortunately, was to emigrate to the West because they didn't see a lot of opportunities in their own societies. And I, I think that's actually very sad. And it definitely tended to uh, attract only the elite students. What you're seeing, in, in, especially in Qatar, is something completely different. They are mainly, um, as I mentioned, for all citizens in the Gulf, the university is free. But in Qatar, for example, they will offer very generous financial aid to students from the region, and they will forgive the loan if they stay and work in the region. So every year they stay in the region and work, they forgive, forgive more of the loan. So they have the money. They're offering a lot of financial aid. So I think in the past, yes, these were only elite universities. And I don't want to overstate the case. They still are elite universities. In Qatar, for example, most students would not even dream of going to Education City. They would go to the state university. 70% of the graduates go to Qatar University. And and as a matter of fact, some of them resent Education City. They see it as this Western kind of transplant. And um, I should mention that Education City is co-educational, and uh, Qatar University is not. So there's, it, it's much more traditional. There's still more of the instruction in Arabic. So I think there, there still is some tension there. But I think there, 
there's great potential for these universities to train. Still, it, it will be the elites, but they are recruiting all around the region. They go on road shows every year, and they actually recruit the best students from the whole region to come to the universities. Hi, my name is Laura Campbell, and I actually did a Fulbright project a couple of years ago looking at um, how local educational institutions, both American transplants and, and national universities, interact regionally. And of course, as you well know, they don't mostly interact right. regionally. They mostly just interact with Western uh, colleagues who are regarded as better qualified. But I was wondering, to what extent do you think that the training of non-national people at these American institutions, whether it's in the UAE or in Qatar, is going to lead to a sense of attachment to the country where they were educated and sort of um, growing a sort of, nationalism is too strong a word, but a sense of affinity for the country where they were trained, since they'll almost certainly, especially in the case of Qatar, stay right. there to work right. in order to forgive their loans. Right. I actually think that's a, that's a goal of the government. Uh, for example, in Education City, there was talk when I was there the last time about creating a, a core course about Qatar, the history, the culture that every single student in all of the programs would take in order to develop some kind of, uh, some kind of ties to the region. So I can definitely see that happening. By the way, something else I didn't mention is because I was being very brief, I'm talking, I've m mainly focused on the elite American universities. What an American university is in the region is, uh, is very much open to question, okay? You c it goes from the branch campus of Cornell Medical, uh, Medical School to a university that calls itself an American university, but there's nothing American about it, and it's also not a university. Some of them trade on the stock exchange, and, and unfortunately, some students have really been um, taken in by this because they don't really know what it is, and they end up getting degrees that are worthless because they're not, uh, they, they didn't meet the qualifications of the, of the regulators. So there's a whole range of what's out there. So there's all different types. I'm really focusing a lot in my book on the elite ones. Hi, thanks for your talk. Okay. It was really uh, interesting, and I uh, look forward to the book. Um, my question regards um, employability, and um, I, I'm for world learning, by the way, and we do uh, exchanges and training programs and so forth. Um, the link between universities and employability. Um, I wanted to ask in particular of the American universities that you've seen, what particular uh, role do they play in employability in terms of linking students to jobs um, in the local economy or in the global economy? Um, how is that different between uh, Lebanon and the Gulf or potentially what could happen in some of uh, like Egypt or some of the, the um, newer opportunities? Well, I think the whole reason the universities are here is to uh, increase employability. I think it's well known that in Egypt, for example, a lot of students coming straight out of university have to immediately go into a retraining program if they want to be qualified for a job. So the whole reason for bringing in these universities was to teach skills for the global marketplace already in the classroom. There's a big focus, I didn't mention this, on many of the programs in bringing in some of the liberal arts, writing courses, uh, courses that focus on research and critical thinking. They've also, uh, in some of the some of the universities, private as well as state universities, they're trying to uh, build internship programs to give students more practical experience. And I know in Kuwait, uh, one of the academics shared with me, they actually, before they reformed the university, in Kuwait University, and I specifically was looking at the business school, where they also got American accreditation and switched to English, they did a survey of employers in Kuwait and said, what do you think the graduates are lacking? What do they need to learn? So they actually are really very tuned into this because that, that is the goal that the students be able to get jobs. And what they found, interestingly enough, in, in Kuwait, and this was a study about 10 years ago now, is that um, th they said that the students didn't have good skills in either English or Arabic. And so they really had, uh, had to, to, to really start from the ground up. But there is a big focus on that. And as a matter of fact, they actually select the programs based on what they think the economy needs. In Qatar, they have a medical school, a design school, a journalism school. I mean, they're hand-picking. They're only what they think the society needs. So that is the whole entire purpose of these universities. Anybody else? I have a comment and, and an invitation as well. Um, first of all, that was fascinating, and I think the historic reference is, is particularly um, compelling. Um, I just want to mention, we are from the American University of Afghanistan, um, which is five years old. 
modeled after AUB and AUC. Mm -hmm. And we started with 53 students five years ago, and we have close to 1,700 now. Um, and so I think the lessons, I'm very anxious to read your book, and perhaps you could add a postscript and come and visit the American University of Afghanistan. I think, I think the, the lessons that you have learned, um, we are trying to apply many of those because we're obviously in a very fragile environment. And we don't have the kind of financing. There's no financing from the, from the uh, Afghan government. And nearly all of our students require some sort of financial aid. So we're, we're, in, a, we're in a challenging and um, I think difficult environment. But the success is really quite astounding. And this is the first one ever in the history of this country. We just started the first MBA program as well. And, and I, I'm interested in your comments particularly on, on the adaptation, and this is starting from the ground up. There, there is no, right. um, um, we are, and it is totally, all of our students are Afghan. I think it'll be a long time before any of, any students here want to come and study in <laughs> Afghanistan. <laughs> We'd like to do that, but I don't think it's going to happen, so. Well, maybe I can share a few more lessons that I didn't have uh, time to before. I mentioned several times that the universities are not able to find qualified students. So they're getting very creative in ways to cultivate those qualified students. For example, uh, I'll just take the example of Cornell Medical School, where I spent a long time. It's very hard to convince the locals to go to medical school. It's a long road. It's hard. And uh, it's you know, many years of training followed by an internship, many, many years, when the traditional path has been to take a, a job in the, in the private sector, which is actually, I visited many of the, uh, in the public sector workplaces, the very short hours, excellent benefits. You can retire very young. So what they're doing, and this could be a lesson for everywhere in the region, is they're starting to find the students at a very young age. They're looking at junior high schools. They're offering special programs for them. Come for a week and see what it's like to be a doctor. Or Georgetown's campus at, in Qatar uh, has a, a summer camp about international relations in junior high school. So they're starting really from a young age to try to find those students because really they're all fighting over the qualified students. So, um, so that, is, that is one lesson that I could share. Could I just uh, follow, follow up with that? You talked about attracting qualified students. What about attracting qualified faculty and retaining that faculty? Yeah. One of the things that I encountered in Morocco, for example, there's a university called Al mm -hmm. Um And it's sort of in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of the country, but it's modeled after an American university system. But they had trouble retaining faculty. I mean, they would get American professors or French professors who would stay for a year or two and say, no, this isn't for me, and then leave. Right. Right. Talk about it. That's an excellent question, which I also didn't have time to go into. One of the biggest problems from the side of the American universities is getting the faculty to go over, to, to, to be abroad, especially their permanent faculty. They don't want to go, and, uh, because it would mean relocating their family to, a, to another country. So this is a big problem, and it becomes a question. At what point is it still a degree from a school like Georgetown if none of the faculty have ever taught in Georgetown? So the universities are trying to really combat this. Uh, for example, NYU is creating tenure track positions specifically for these overseas locations. Or in Georgetown, they, they want a certain percentage of their faculty to be from the university. But in most of the universities, I have to say, they're not coming from the universities. And the degree that you're getting is really not the same degree at all. I did identify, as I said before, there is a whole class of academics that maybe they can't get jobs in the US, <laughs> and they're traveling all over the, the world. And I was very struck by, for some of them, how little they know about the region. Just to share one example, is I, I met some faculty members at the American University of Kuwait, and the head of student services there uh, you know, came from New York and was really not familiar with the, with the region at all and have, have no understanding of, uh, of, what they're, of what they're dealing with. You know, they're trying, they, 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 they just, it's, it's just taking them from one foreign location to another. And I think it will add a lot to the quality if they can solve this problem of getting the faculty and retaining them. But it's one of the biggest challenges. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to follow up on that question about retaining faculty. Um, I'm, I'm curious how you understand NYU to be doing a, to creating tenure track positions in a country that doesn't have academic freedom, since tenure is based on the premise of academic freedom, just how that's playing out. Right. Well, the whole issue of academic freedom is a very touchy subject, as you can imagine. And in Qatar, for example, um, actually, th there's a dichotomy. For the locals that are uh, faculty, they get tenure or traditionally have gotten tenure almost immediately. And that was part of the problem. They didn't actually have to research. There were no, th because it was considered another public sector job. But the, pro the, the faculty um, expatriate factory actually couldn't get tenure. It just wasn't a possibility. And in some countries, they had them on one-year contracts, 
What they're trying to do now, uh, Sheikh Hamosa is personally involved in this, is to have rolling contracts for the faculty. So they don't have to face that pressure. And uh, they, they know that they can, they can stay for the long haul. But it is true. It is one of the tensions. And the whole issue of academic freedom really fascinated me. And what I found is, in, in the countries I studied, um, there was a lot of self-censorship going on. Because people understood that you cannot um, bite the hand that feeds you, shall we say. So people would not criticize the government. And they would be very, uh, very careful about what they would say. And when they do, there's actually consequences. There was a recent case. It didn't get that much press coverage. But um, an adjunct faculty member, I believe from Paris Sorbonne, during the Arab Spring, made some statements critical of the government, saying, oh, well, in, in Abu Dhabi, there should be more democratization. And he was put in prison uh, for seven months. And there was a lot of outcry the, you know, from the home university saying, well, why aren't we sticking up for this professor? And this wasn't supposed to happen. But it's still a very touchy issue. So I think what you mostly see is that there is, there is, a lot of, there is freedom of speech, but people are self-censoring. They don't, they don't go anywhere near criticizing the government. That's where they won't, they won't go. But yeah, it's one of the conflicts. Could you please do a comparison for us between the universities in the region that are part of the region, I'm talking about AUB, LAU, AUC, yeah. and those who are dependent purely on government funding, because yeah. the, the diff one of the differences from our point of view is there's a sustainability in those yes. universities that have grown up in a part of the region that the others don't have. They're artificially implanted, and we don't yeah. know if the implant's going to take or not. Yeah. I completely agree with you. And actually, it's very telling in Education City. The, um, the, the, first of all, it's hard to get a lot of details about the arrangements they're making with the universities. I originally wanted to write my book about the financial aspects of it until I quickly realized that no one would talk to me about that. So I kind of changed the, I changed the focus of the book. No one, no one wants to talk about it. But in Education City, they're building buildings for the universities. But from what I could understand, they're only working on five-year contracts with them. So if they're not happy with the university, they could just, you know, they could, they could remove it and bring someone else in. So I think you're absolutely right. I, I don't think that's the ideal model. I think, I really do think the ideal model is building from the ground up. One example I didn't have time to talk about is the American University of Sharjah which is based um, on the model of the American University of Beirut. And they had specific advising. And a lot of uh, faculty personnel from American University of Beirut came to Sharjah. And they built in about, I think they opened in 1998, a very successful university. Uh, it's, it's actually turning into a research university. It's a very elite liberal arts college as well. And that model is, I think, it's when you build from the ground up, you're, you're there to stay. But looking back to the, the problem with that model, even in the ones that have built, I didn't mention this for the American University of Beirut, it, had a lot, it almost fell a few other times because of financial crises. It didn't have the funding. At first, it was privately funded. Then after the Cold War, it was funded by the US government, which became controversial. Then the government funding went down. In recent years since the Civil War, they're trying to, to, to build up their fundraising and build up their endowment based on their, on their graduates, alumni like American universities. But, when the governments don't pay for it, there's also that problem of the, of the finances. Where's the money going to come from? So I think it's, um, it's a dilemma, because even uh, American University of Beirut, again, the financial future is always uncertain. In the other ones that are funded by the government, it does seem more certain. But again, how long are they willing to invest in it? It seems to me that in Qatar, they really are investing for the long term, because they have a whole program. They're building a $3 billion hospital. Uh, it's called the Sidra Medical Center. And I, it seems to me that they really aren't investing for the long term. But I do suspect that many of the universities you see, especially the ones that went in there to make a quick profit, they're going to close down very quickly, as we saw with George Mason and Michigan State. Hi. Um, I'm wondering if this is not working. I try things that it's for, rec it's for recording. Could be if it could be a platform perhaps for intercultural change with Israel. I, I'm speaking particularly about the American University in Cairo since the whole diplomatic problem with other Arab states. But has there been any exchange with academics or students perhaps from Israel coming to study? Or could there be in the future? And do you think that's a good idea and a place where 
these minds can meet, perhaps. Well, there was one example of this, and that was in, the, in Education City, the Georgetown School of Foreign Service. When it first opened up, there were relations with Israel. And they actually um, sent, they had Shimon Perez come to speak to students on campus, and they actually sent a delegation of students to Israel, which was the first time ever. Um, during Operation Cast Lead, they broke off relations between the countries, so it's not happening right now. But I think, um, I think there could be some opportunity for it in the future. But there would probably there would have to be relations between the countries for it to happen. And can an Israeli student enroll in one of the American branches in, in NYU? I mean, it would, how, how would NYU defend having a campus in uh, Abu Dhabi but not allowing Israeli students to enroll in it? Actually, that issue came up quite a bit, and um, there was a lot of discussion of, among this. And s by the way, some universities, based on their debates on campus, decided not to go this route. Like, I believe it was U University of North Carolina, um, Yale University. A number of universities said, we're not even going to go here because there's too, many, uh, there are too many problems, there's too many conflicts, as you mentioned here. Uh, the, the countries have said that Jewish faculty members, Israeli faculty members can, can be there, but there aren't too many of them, as far as I can see. So I, I don't know of any Israeli students that study in any of these. Right, I, but I don't know if that's because the Israeli students wouldn't feel comfortable studying there, right. or it's because there's an actual policy that the government won't allow us to have Israeli students here. I think it might be um, considered an unfriendly environment. Just to give an example, um, when I was there in Education City, as I mentioned during Operation Cast Lead, there was um, Sheikh Moza herself became very active in the issue. I, I could talk a lot about the Qatar Foundation and what they're doing. Uh, part of what they do is they invest in um, conflict areas around the world. Gaza is a very big issue. So when I was there, there were protests, interestingly enough, not on campus, but in Doha itself. And w I'll just share one story, is when I was in uh, the Starbucks on campus, the students were standing in line, and one student came by and said, um, nobody should buy coffee at Starbucks because the owner of Starbucks is Israeli and the money goes to the IDF, and whatever, so everyone should leave Starbucks. But I have to say, not one student got out of the line. <laughs> I guess the latte was more important. <laughs> this is a curriculum question. Um, I believe that a large number of the students at these universities major in engineering and business, but yet your normal model of a liberal arts college is you have a broad range, a community of scholars studying right. you know, everything else. And how does this strong preference for those two areas of study uh, affect the, the entire project? That's an excellent question. I mean, I think all over the world, if you look at what most American universities are doing, it is business. And I think to give another example, which I only briefly touch upon in my book, is um, Kaust University in Saudi Arabia, where they purely want science and technology. They put about $9 billion into creating what they want to do overnight to be MIT. So I think there is a preference for that. My belief is the countries that are more committed to this for the long term, like in Education City, they actually are bringing in the liberal arts, but only in some of the programs. Georgetown School of uh, Foreign Service, for example, it does have a liberal arts component, and some of the other schools as, as well, and they have cross-registration for them. But, uh, but I do have to say that the most popular uh, branch campus is Texas A&M Engineering, which does not have liberal arts. So, and when they do have the liberal arts, there's come some very interesting situations arose that they shared with me. One of the required courses in Georgetown is called the problem of God. Now, in these countries, there is no problem with God, but apparently the, um, the students had interesting discussions. One of the professors told me that they do a lot of video conferencing to try to hook up, to create some kind of tie with the, um, with the home campus. They were having a political discussion in which the Georgetown professor from Washington, D.C. was saying, well, you know, of course, everyone wants to become a democracy and democratization. And one of the, the Qatari students raised her hand and said, but why are you assuming everyone wants to have a democracy? We're very happy with our system. So there are some interesting uh, clashes that come up. And I think my belief is the ones that are committed to liberal arts. And it's not just these American universities. Any university that gets American accreditation has a liberal arts component. For example, uh, Qatar University has a core curriculum that they've been developing over the years. Zayed University has liberal arts and a core curriculum. So it is spreading slowly. And I think the ones that want to stay, or American University of Sharjah, all of those are based on liberal arts. And I think those are the, the models for, I, I think they're also aware that if they want to train leaders, these are the kind of skills that they have to give them. Um, so except funding, what preconditions do you think are necessary in order to make a university to work? That's a great question. <laughs> um, I, don't, I really think it's, um, I, I think you have to have a long-term view. 
I think as, uh, as someone told me, one of the deans in uh, Education City said, you know, they, they want to create this overnight, but it will take at least a generation. I think you have to have the patience and the commitment to know that you can't, I, I don't think that you, you, can, you can go from having no infrastructure and basis to having this strong world-class university overnight. So I think you need patience. And I think you need the commitment that you actually believe in this project, that you're willing to invest in it over the long term. And I think, for example, in Dubai, there is not that commitment. It, it's just a business. It's like any other business. And therefore, I, I don't see a great future for, for great universities developing there. I think we have time for maybe one more question or comment. Hi, thanks. Um, I'm really interested in any of your findings related to the partnership-based model um, over the implant model or the ground-up model. Right. Well, as I mentioned, it's, um, it's mostly just developing. Um, Although so there, have been, there have been a lot of partnerships. I, I should kind of backtrack a little bit. Some of the partnerships, I think, are just used in name only. For example, the American University of Kuwait, which is a, a private university in Kuwait, it mentioned they had some partnership with Dartmouth, and they mentioned some other, but it was unclear what the partnership actually meant. And I think in some cases, it's just to gain some prestige to, to, so students will be attracted to that Ivy League name. Other partnerships are deeper. The American University of Sharjah had a specific relationship with, I believe, American University, in which they contracted with American University to help them with their administration and, and building up the, the curriculum. So that was a, um, those partnerships I mentioned, though, so far, they're, they're temporary partnerships. And the idea is at a certain point, the university will be standing on its own. I think that um, with MIT, the interesting thing about it is that the, uh, in Abu Dhabi, they, they, they didn't want a partnership. It was MIT that pushed for the partnership and said, we don't think this is the right model. So I think it's also coming, um, I mean, I think it's stronger. I think the universities that develop on their own with the partnerships, they will stand more on their own. But I, I think it's also coming from the sides of the American universities that have seen other universities being burned and they don't want to, uh, to jump into the fire. Um, any questions from the overflow room back there? We have people in the room behind us who have been watching. You very briefly touched on uh, the role of U.S. government uh, assistance to the whole process of uh, educational uh, interaction, and just very specifically in the case of AUB. Um, there's quite a long history of university partnership programs. Um, I'm wondering if um, with the demise of um, the U.S. Information Agency in this country if there's no longer any trace of the work that was done in the region and you never even came across it? Well, that's a good question. I didn't come across too much of it, and I have to say that my focus was mainly on the new universities. And the new universities are, are um, pretty much being funded, either self-funded or funded by, by the governments themselves. So I didn't, I didn't come across too much of that. But I do think there's a big role to revive it. And I think it's um, the most interesting feature, what I should stress, that came up is, is the demand for American higher education. So it wouldn't actually be imposing it on the countries. This is something that it's more market driven. This is what they want. And I think that it could, uh, it could play a big role. But in terms of what happened in the past, I, I did not see many traces of it. But then again, I wasn't looking at most of the universities where it, it was, the state universities. Let me make one comment on that. If you take AUC, LAU, and AUB, 2010 was the most money given to those schools ever. Not as a percent of their budget, but of absolute right. dollars. But not from the government, correct? From the U.S. government. Oh, from the U.S. government. Okay. Well, I want to thank uh, Dr. Rubin for an extremely interesting and informative discussion. Uh, we look forward to the books coming out later, on, later in the year. I assume you'll be sending a free copy to the Middle East Institute, right? Of course. Yeah. <laughs> um, and thank you all for coming today. So. Thank you.